All right. Thanks for coming on, everybody. We have some cool stuff to talk about. I spent several hours in the bees today, and boy, that was a treat. Uh, the weather was almost 60 degrees Fahrenheit. It was a little bit windy, but that's pretty typical. If we're going to have that warm of weather in early February or like it is late January, then it usually comes with a wind and lots of rain, and I mean lots of rain. But the bees were gathering the first bits of maple pollen of significance and they were just all up in these maple trees that we have here in the yard and the brood rearing i was going through colonies today and was just really blown away that we were seeing colonies that had a solid frame of brood and then additional frames that were like half a frame of brood so probably all together the biggest colonies were pushing two frames of brood and then several of them had one frame of brood. And there was a few of them, the smaller colonies with, you know, about four frame clusters that just had little patches and they have not done a lot quite yet. We also went through the Apame colonies and some of the insulated colonies, and it was a noticeable difference on how much more brood that they had. So we're going to be taking your questions here in just a little bit. I've got a special guest that I'll have on for a little while, and I'm excited to to introduce him with a lot of you i'm already jumping in uh, good to see you randy the tar hill the beekeeper tar hill beekeeper yeah yeah um roll tie by the way just had to throw that in there yeah bee season's almost here ian um, all the way from the uk um we have oh sweden hey hope you're doing good it was so it, it was really a, a need to get to I'm, I'm gonna bring that one up so uh she flew all the way out to hive life this year we got to meet her in person and and talk bees i was so so glad that she was there for multiple reasons one because she's been with us since the beginning of youtube as far as i remember and then on top of that she was shorter than me which there's not a lot of people at hive life that are shorter than me so <laughs> that was great uh we had a lot of fun and hello from maryland california all over the place and one thing I'll say real quick is I said it incorrectly in the last live chat. Um, I am going to be in Scottsville, Kentucky, February the 4th. I'll be the keynote presenter there and doing some other topics um, outside of my keynotes as well. Primarily focused on how to make your small hobby a sideline or how to take your small sideline to a small business. I'm going to talk about that. And then some of my other talks are going to revolve around, okay, I've been successful in my first year. Now I have some bees and this is my second year. And <laughs> I'll get to that one in just a second. And then what am I going to do in my second year to be successful? So Jared says, I'm in Gainesboro right near, now, bull and thistle for wife's birthday. Well, Jared, smart man. You got to get you know, your wife out to uh, some nice restaurants. And we don't have a lot of great options um, it's like a bowl and thistle or Dairy Queen. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't want to give your wife a gastrointestinal distress for her birthday. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the bowl and thistle is uh, pretty darn good. I haven't eaten there in years. I, I need to take Laurel. Buried in snow in Ontario. Yeah, it's uh, quite a bit different down here in Tennessee. We're definitely early. We're three weeks earlier than normal. Uh, the, the bees are definitely ahead and so i'm starting to put the nutrition to them I actually fed our bees some syrup 10 days ago and and they took the majority of it in it was extremely thick syrup um, we don't normally do that i wanted to test it out primarily because i've always been told that you cannot do that here and i'm sure that it would be unwise to do that further north um, however it's so far it's been working good Hey, Randall, I appreciate you saying that. That is the reason that we do what we do. Um, it has worked as good as I, actually worked better than I thought it would, that if we help support other beekeepers, because we really struggled, Laurel and I, building our hobby into a sideline, sideline into a professional business. And we thought, well, if we can help other people out, it's going to be good for the industry. And it has. There's a lot of things coming in on the pipeline, and it's hard to realize all the exciting new things that are happening if you weren't beekeeping 20 years ago, like I was. Um, and we just didn't have so much 
innovation. We definitely did not have such wonderful access to education. And speaking of education, let's bring on somebody who some of you may have watched his videos and he was at Hive Life as one of our presenters, um, Richard Noel. <laughs> no, I can't do a French accent. Hey, Richard. Noel. Noel. <laughs> Noel. Hi, Noel. And hi, everybody. Awesome to be back. Nice, um, nice gear got, right there. I've got the hat, I've got the t-shirt, and I've even got the mug. Cheers. Uh, that's right. We just next year we'll, we'll we'll make some Hive Life boxers, and then you can take those. <laughs> well, off. I would not be modeling those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good gosh. Uh, so, so it's a uh, early in the year for us to have brood but as you know richard sometimes things uh, every year is a little bit different from the next and so as you're prepping into your bee season it's an exciting time of the year it's when we're telling ourselves these lives of all the things that we can accomplish <laughs> this year <Yeah. laughs> i've yeah, seen yeah. it in so many beekeepers already and and, um, and and the one thing i i always laugh is and i don't mean this in any way negative but or a lot of beekeepers are telling me, oh, my bees have made it through the winter. But I just would like to give a word of caution because we could still have a long way to go. I know you get maple pollen in usually around two to three weeks, don't you? Yeah, usually mid-February on average. Yeah, and, and we kind of uh, can get, I mentioned to you the other week, we get a, a plant called uh, false, false acacia or mimosa. And it's a bright yellow fluffy globular pollen and it can come in by the bucket load but some years we get it and some years the trees get ripped to sheds by the wind and gales and if we get it early and we have a nice period the brood is just amazing you know we just get that boost but it all depends it's so hinged so um you were talking about uh, your um pollen feed and i've just put a comment on your video you just uploaded because I wish we could get it. And what you use that for is such great advice because you, if you get those huge highs and then the huge lows, it's those dips you want to be able to just smooth over that nutrition in the colony if you can, just to keep them going so they don't crash. But uh, when absolutely. our pollen starts here, we usually are fine. Mm -hmm. It comes in in so much quantity that they, we're like, why do we bother even feeding pollen sub? But Exactly. You know, you're like that dilemma, isn't it? Do you, don't you, do you, don't you? Well, how much, how much do you feed on average? We're, I think some people think that we're feeding it every single week. And, you know, we look and see if the weather's great and our bees are flying that week hard. Well, then we skip that week. But if we look at the next week and we're like, oh man, it's going to be 10 days before they can get out and fly good. Then we're yeah. in there and we're going to chuck those patties in. If you just get one patty on, that's going to just give that that feeling of continuity in the colony, I, I think it does. Um, we, we've had such big discussions on this and, and and I speak to a lot of UK beekeepers and they're all like of different opinions. And, and I think no matter what you do with pollen sub, it, as long as it's a good one, and as long as you feel that it's been consumed and it's a soft one, like you say, that's key to it. You don't want to rock hard, something they've got to gnaw on and you get lumps appearing else underneath the hive, stuff like that. If it's a nice soft patty, they take it down and they use it all. And that's the thing, you know? um absolutely so you know but you only feed a couple three four if it's a bad year you know you end up feeding like four or five pounds a hive at least for us but typically we're we're probably throwing on three pounds a, a, a production colony through the winter uh, build it up into spring and if it's a really good spring not even that much and then if it's a bad year there might be five or six pounds that get thrown yeah. in there but it's it's just a tool yeah. It is. What other? Um, well, someone just had a question. I'm going to touch it real fast, and it was a uh, Talisha Davis. Um, how can I get in touch with you about buying a couple of nukes? I'll actually be sending out some information very soon. It'll be a form that people can fill out. Um, we do not ship any packages or any nukes. Everything is pickup only, and we'll be selling um, a few hundred nukes this year, and it'll be first come, first serve basis. But um, all of our nukes are, are ready to rock and roll, but just keep an eye on that. I will post a YouTube video and Facebook posts if you do the Facebook, and, and we'll be happy to see if we can get you some nukes. Um, so we're, we're prepping into our season. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I've seen a picture of your son, and he is like uh, a 
foot and a few inches taller than me. So he is a he's a tall fella, um, even taller than the dirt rooster. Absolutely. And Randy's a, a, a big boy. So uh, lots of fun. Thank you so much for donating and being a part of a hive life in our YouTube channel and and uh, take care. And I hope you have a good season with your bees. So, Richard, uh, what are you doing right now to prep for this season? Maybe not, maybe not pollen patty feeding, but there's equipment. Um, of course, you yeah, have the honey house. The work, is, work is endless. The work is endless. Um, as you know, I'm doing um, my new building starts going up Monday. So that's taken a massive slab of my work out of it. But putting that aside, I've got dead outs that I'm not hiding everybody. We had such a bad problem last end of the summer autumn with Asian hornets. We've got colonies that went into the winter small because they had very few young nurse bees. Mm hmm. And the UK is on like uh, tender hooks because they're worried about Asian Hornet moving into the UK. May or may not happen. I don't think it will because they've got the training and they've got the right things in place to deal with. But for us, it's a nightmare. So now we've got a lot of colonies that are small. And if we have that cold spell that we talked about, I'm actually I've got pollen sub ready to go on this coming week. Mm -hmm. So any colony I've got that, that I'm going to give them whatever I can to get them through. I've got 100 nukes that I'm probably going to have to use all of them. But that is my sustainability that I built in. Mm -hmm. So, OK, I'm going to take a cut because I'm not going to have the income from the nukes that I made. But it doesn't matter. Where are my nukes when I need them? They're in my yards, ready to be put back into boxes to cover your losses. That is what it's all about. That's how you cover your losses. But the biggest thing... It's clearing out old boxes for me because there's endless work of that. You've got to get in there, just spend literally three or four days or a week going through your old boxes, cleaning them out, burning them out, keeping that cycle going, reusing the wax, you know, melting it down, all that kind of stuff, cleaning up. That's that's my job now. For on our bees itself, there's very little to do. I'm actually going to do an oxalic acid this week as well, if I can, uh, vaporize, yeah. um, because I'm late with that. And we ha we've had such windy weather. We just haven't been able to get in the apiary, so I'm just going to do what I can. It's all systems it's, go, and uh, I'm going to move up. too late. You know, it's not too late here or in a lot of places to still do that vaporization, though. It, it and, kind of is. For us, it's too late, but I've got I've got no choice. But carry on. Sorry. Well, I um, mean, it, it's not as ideal as doing it in December or something like yeah. that, but it still can be done. And maybe instead of doing it once, if you have the time, doing it three times, if there's a little bit of brood in there to to help knock them back, but. It, it's there's still benefit to it and as far as you know the preparation and all that kind of stuff goes uh you know it, there's always endless work when you're a beekeeper it's kind of part of the reason why we like it because most of us hate being bored but uh a couple of us every now and then would, would like to have a little break to um i i always say it's nice to have the possibility of being bored because you always find something else uh, yeah it, <laughs> it never happens <laughs> it, it never never happens um i remember my life before beekeeping um yeah not really i started when i was 14 so <laughs> my entire adult life has been dominated by agriculture beekeeping and bluegrass so i've never had any money really um but uh, to spend on on personal stuff, it's all bees and bluegrass instruments. But so getting into um, oh, real quick, Chris, if you don't mind looking it up on my YouTube channel, there is a link to the interview that I did with Richard on Asian Hornets. So Richard, you brought that up a little bit. It's something that we thankfully don't have here, but it is a large problem in France and some of the surrounding areas where they have. Uh, they have really set up shop and they're just extremely aggressive. They're way more aggressive than European hornets and they reproduce well. And they just, they suppress the area and just, and it's not just honeybees. It's all the other insects and stuff that they just damage, which affects the birds and, mm -hmm. and it, plant it's, it, reproduction. It, ecosystem depresses is the word. They just depress the depress whole area, it. bring it down. Yeah. That's and a, they depress beekeepers as well. No, they depress <laughs> beekeepers as well. <laughs> Well, then, but you know what's so nice for us that you know we don't have them, but your videos uh, show different traps, which ones work better. Um, also, a lot of uh, other ways to uh, prevent uh, your make your bees less vulnerable to yep. the Asian hornets. And so we have that information. I hope that we never get them, but uh, we do seem to get a lot of stuff from Asia here, whether it's hornets or uh, crappy bee equipment. So. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or 
be our foundation that has beeswax on it that's actually paraffins with a little bit of yeah, beeswax that, wrinkled in. We, we've had that here, here a few years ago as well, but we seem to be good now. Um, a lot of us are actually, what we tend to do is we melt our wax down over the year and we trade it in and we, or we exchange it. There's quite a lot of companies over here that you can actually take your wax. You pay a little bit of a premium, but they'll mill it for you and then give you back your wax um that you have in foundation and obviously we still use foundation in our frames but we might go over to your plastic foundation because it's becoming really popular i'm beginning to see the benefits but i'm still a foundation wax guy yeah. myself i have huge respect uh, no, no, sorry no, not in my supers but just in my brood boxes sure i have huge respect for people that still use solid beeswax um that is um a lot of work it's a it's a lot of work in it and it's it's really cool um but the plastic um it's so hard you know we're, we're, we're busy and you try to find ways to get your time back and it's so quick and easy to do and um michael palmer of course he he buys acorn foundation that has no beeswax on it and then he just takes his bees wax and melts it in a pot and just dips it in real fast and shakes it off and just puts a ton of beeswax on it and uh, i've actually was just hitting some research uh, recently where they're finding that there's a big advantage to having uh there's a there's a healthy balance but you know thin coats of beeswax don't get it done you got to have that thick coat of beeswax on there and you guys uh getting that plastic foundation the brood chambers if nothing else i think that once you do it and you realize oh that just saved me two days worth of work this year. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> two days that we don't have and we think we have, but um, that's the thing with beekeeping, isn't it? It's the biggest kind of um, you. You always kind of lie to yourself that you can fit everything in, and you oh, never yeah. do. You, no, you always never. go, "Oh well, we'll sort that out, and we'll sort that." Out. And then as you get towards the end of that week, that space gets less and less and less and then you start to prioritize you know you do we all do crisis management from the word go basically that's how i see it oh yeah um, we're um you know basically uh we, we we think we can do it up till about may yeah and then all the, then we just, it just reaches a certain point during honey productions slash splitting slash queen rearing that um our bubble just gets burst yet again yeah. so i've yeah. got a, a question here that i'm just gonna hit really fast um, my bees are in South Carolina. They're bringing in pollen like crazy dandelions. I think they'll take every drop of sugar water that I give them, though. Is that a good thing or normal? So it is a good thing that your bees are eating. Healthy bees can eat a lot. However, if you feed them too much, you're going to backfill and the queen's not going to have room to lay. So it's going to limit their expansion growth. And then if you backfill too much as well, then you could actually encourage swarming early because those are the things of uh, lots of pollen and lots of nectar or lots of sugar syrup backfilling the brood nest is going to cause a swarming eventually so it, it's all about balance um you just you got to be careful and uh, one of the things that kind of bothers me is some people still say that well bees will just stop taking food whenever they feel like they've got enough that is the biggest load of load of horse nuggets I've ever heard in my life. Uh, but so just find a find a little bit of a balance there. You definitely don't want to uh, be plugging up that brood nest area, but you, you never want to have less than three to four deeps of honey or sugar syrup in a good sized colony. So that's kind of my minimum gauge, and then and then go from there. It's it's funny. I was chatting to someone really far south on the Louisiana kind of side near the Gulf Stream, right next to the coast, and they were showing me some pictures today of their colonies, and they're asking me what should they do, uh, and they've got like two supers on already, and they want to add a third. I'm like, how can you be so far ahead? We haven't <laughs> even got bees flying. You know, it's like um, they're pretty warm. They're pretty warm down there. I know they're getting pollen. Yeah. I I don't think they're getting that much nectar that deep south but i, I could be wrong you know um it, it's a crazy, I, I don't crazy think they are, but there was plenty of honey in the box and i got some videos sent to me of the frames and they've even got brood in the supers you know it's like hey that's a big colony that that, that is um some good protein sling that brood with that honey and mm -mm. 
Um, <laughs> it's, pro it's probably very good for us, but I, I, I'm not going to be eating it. We're going to have to get pretty hard up before I start eating brood on a regular basis. Well, I'm I'm the same. I'll eat, I'll eat, uh, you know, I do eat um, a, a spare queen cell royal jelly. I'll whip that down. I, I quite enjoy that because it's a unique taste, but other people have tried it. I, yeah, I made yeah. a challenge and I challenge you to do it live. You, when you get a, a queen cell, you're, you're ripping out. You just got to get that, suck that raw jelly out and give it that taste because yeah, it's good all, for you. Know? It will you, help you grow. That's the reason why. You know, you might absolutely. be a little bit That's vertically it. challenged because you're not eating challenged. your queen cells. <laughs> By the time I got to the point where I was encountering queen cells on the regular, I, I think I had already maxed out, which <laughs> didn't take long, mind you. Um, however, yeah, I, I think it was only the French would say that something like royal jelly tastes good um it, it must go pair really good with escargot or something like that so um <laughs> yeah. Cameron, have you been seeing pollen coming in where you are we had pollen come in today yes we had the first bit of maples really uh producing um it's definitely not full swing but it's the beginning of it today and and we were going into the colonies and i was seeing brood so we we were slapping on some rocket fuel patties um, from the conference, and those bees were taken to them. Um, it's, it's a good patty. So I had a, another question really quick, Paul Kruger. Going into my second year with two double deep colonies, no extra comb yet. My goal this year is to add a resource nuke and raise some queens, struggling to figure out the timing plan in West North Carolina. So, you know, West North Carolina can't be too far off from my schedule. I would say a week or two in either direction of where I'm at. So the, the main thing I would just keep on to your colonies in, in March, we can start seeing some swarm cells if the, the weather is ahead and we are ahead in my area. So you might be too. And just, just keep ahead of your bees. I would make, uh, if you can get to like five over five nukes, five deep, five deep, and have two of them you could easily take those two double deep colonies and you know make those resource nukes and and raise your own queens heck you might have some queen cells that are started as swarm cells and take those into those resource nukes and and, and do it that way having those backup nukes is just crucial to sustainability you got to have it totally let's, let's see here um I think so, it's just yeah. to say that it's surprising when you start making nukes, it's like a revelation because you you suddenly take a step back and you're like, I remember when I first got into it, you, you kind of take a step back and you're like, wow, now I've got that and I've got that and I've got that. Oh, and that needs splitting and I can do something with that as well. And I can take brood from that and that one's weak so I can top something up with that one. So it gives you that total um, flexibility. You can You can always fix something when you've got a resource nukes. So this is an opportunity for you to talk bad about me. I've got to plug in my computer or we're all fixing to go bye bye. So <laughs> <laughs> give me one second. Well, I've got the helm. So hi, everybody. I, you know, I could talk about the size that came in, but that's kind of worn out now. Um, yeah. I, I've got the opportunity to also say if you ever get the, the, the possibility to go to Hive Life conference, go, because it was the best experience I've ever had in my life. And I came as going to be really modest now and pretend it's all like, ah, oh, don't be so that. But he did an amazing job. And um, I was I got there and I was completely like bowled over by how good it was. So if you ever get the chance to go, as soon as those tickets come online this year, get yourself a ticket and get yourself down to it, wherever it's going to be, whatever you decide to do, because it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, well, thanks. Well, thanks I've, just, I've done your filling in. You can carry on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, hey, that was that was a perfectly timed, shameless plug that I, you know, that we just had. But um, you can send me another check later if you like. That's right, <laughs> another one. All right. Oh wow. Um, um, I, I'll get to that in just one second. Hey, real quick, Richard Noel's um, the video I did with Richard. It was about a year ago today, actually. Yep. Very darn close. And this is a, a great presentation or he just shows you different traps and methods to employ with these Asian hornets. Um, even though we don't have them yet, there's a lot of stuff that you can take away from it. If you have European hornets setting up or yellow yeah. jackets, because these, these are lesser problems, but they still are very similar. 
And it's just, I, I enjoy the presentation quite a bit. Um, so check that out. The link's right there. And I, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to Yasmin, who has donated a ton for the youth program. And, and she has just donated a lot over the years. So thank you so much. The Hive Life Youth Program, 100% of that money goes to um, young men and women between the ages of 12 and 20. And we had 26 of them this year, and it was, I thought, pretty successful. And they, they had a good time. Uh, some of them are they're still like in a chat group and they're messaging each other. So, you know, we've got kind of our chat group of us old guys. And now the, <laughs> the next generation's probably texting how, you know, how poor we are with technology and how we're yeah. they're fixing to kick our butts and take our names. Yeah. But, um, thank, thank you so much for that donation. And um, you know, the, the kid program this year, we have already raised $17,000, um, a little bit more now with that for, for the youth program. And so we have already eclipsed where we were all of last year in the first three weeks um that and then 50 percent more than what we had last year so i'd say we're gonna have 50 to 60 kids with full rides it's gonna be a blast um so we were talking about those asian hornets and all that kind of stuff but um one of the things that you've been working on is uh your swinty bottling yeah um, i know I'm, I'm spoiled i'm spoiled i spoiled myself totally and it's like you've got that one there and i know you've been using it but it's it's just like living the dream, to be honest. You know, you, you're not trying to use the handle to, to get the honey in. And if you get too much in, you haven't got to use spoons. Every single one is like done. It's it's a dream. It really is. It, 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 it's, it's a guilty pleasure almost. It is. <laughs> it, it feels too good to be true. Us beekeepers are used to too much abuse, and that's too nice. But, uh, you know, the thing of it is uh, you and I, I think one of the reasons we wanted to have you at Hive Life, um, there's there are several reasons, but one of the reasons was because you haven't lost the fervor for beekeeping and also the bee community. And so many people that I, I've dealt with at other speaking engagements or seen over the years, they they do like bees, but they don't really like beekeepers. Um, they don't like other people. They're just not people persons, and and you still really love it and. Uh, you know, Bob's this way too, and and maybe it is hard. Sometimes I, I kind of feel this way because when you deal with thousands of people, 90-something percent of them are awesome. They're the reason Hive Life exists, but there's the 2 to 3 percent that drive you crazy, and it's those people that want to drive you away from doing a lot of this kind of thing that comment on your videos and tell you how ugly you are. <laughs> um, and, and that kind of stuff and, and, and they're right but you know whatever um and why, why would you do that and so we, well, we I, really, I, I never get any of those comments came i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> i never get any of them <laughs> they're just in other languages you just <laughs> them, richard um but, but in all seriousness though um you know that's one of the things that i love so much about bob as well is you know, he's been doing it for so many years. He still loves beekeepers so much in the industry. And and Bob will sit down and talk to you about how he started and the humble yeah. beginnings he had extracting with a hand crank and like a basement or a garage or whatever it was yeah. and building his own even frames because he just didn't have the money to buy even unassembled frames at that point. Yeah. And I rem a lot of your videos, you can go back and watch on how you've built up over the years and, and gone from, you know, more sideline to full, you know, now you're putting in a honey house and buying all the, these bells and whistles and uh, <laughs> exactly. Well, and I, well, I bought them and it's like, but I, I, I totally get it. And, and I would also reiterate that I am extremely privileged because I've, I, um, I'm buying a lot of new equipment and it, it I, I kind of don't want, it's, it's no one's business, but I'm happy to say that, well, I'm not happy to say, but I'll tell you, it's a lump sum I'm using and mm -hmm. it's very nearly gone, but I've used that money really carefully. And as mm -hmm. soon as this current financial crisis came about, I went about and thought, right, well, 
we've got raging interest rates here. The goods, if I don't buy them now, they're going to be 11% more in a year's time. So I went out and made my purchases. I, I was so lucky that this resource that we're talking on now is exactly what I'm talking about. I had all these people out there like yourself, we've got Sween T who bought machines. And I went to them and said, what do I do? What do I get? I went to my mate Ollie, visited him in Ireland, as you saw that video probably. Yeah, I did. He had, he had the same machine. He's been doing it a different way. And and what my, my point is, I had this really cool resource at my fingertips to ask so many people so many questions. And I think they're all bored to death of me now asking. But now I'm kind of... Yeah, this is your last and, interview, Richard. We're starting to... <laughs> <laughs> it's finished, yeah. Right. Um, but I, but I ha I'm, I feel privileged, and I think everyone getting back to the hive life, like we're talking about the discussion when we had with, with Bob and Ian and everyone else who was there at that table, they're all really humble, and they've all come from like backgrounds where they've all started somewhere, and that's kind of what we can all folk we will have common common ground on it's it's incredible but we've all got that knowledge, and I I said I consider myself kind of really privileged because I'm now bought all this gear through all this experience and, and speaking to all these people but i've had that one chance that some people may never have you know so i'm just going to try and work really hard to bring it together the, my end of things now and try sure. and do something really good with it but i'm still going to be struggling i've got to make big mistakes because everyone has to make mistakes to grow and please video those mistakes so we can i will can you worry i mean you know <laughs> and... i'm just ne next monday they're coming to actually put this building that's been delivered together and once that goes up, everything will change because I will feel um, that now I have a building after all the work I've actually, all I've got still is a slab that was two swimming pools, as mm -hmm. you probably saw. Um, but that now I've just hoovered them out again today because it rained over the weekend. So they had another hoovering. So it's the second time I've been going up and down. And you know, But anyway, as from next week, I should have something to say right now. And then I can move gear in it. Even if it's in the corner out the way while we do the other work, I've got dry storage. Well, I'm, I'm fixing to, to build a honey house in the next year or so. And so this is it's, it's really beneficial to me. There's a lot of tips that I'm going to pick up. Um, I, I've been talking to Bob about it, too. And yeah. you talked about talking to your buddy, Ollie. And, and that's what it's all about, because I've learned more in the last three or four years than the 16, 15 years prior. But I've been able to network with so many people. And it's not just people that are high profile like Bob and Ian and you that have YouTubes. But, you know, some of the people are on this live chat right now who are messaging um, us and, and they've sent me emails with with really good tips. And and of uh, I, I remember one of the guys that uh, was subscribed to me was like, hey, have you seen this? Have you ever heard of this guy named Bob Benny before? And Bob had like I don't know, 800,000 subscribers at that, that point. And he had like four videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, who would name their son Bob Benny? I mean, <laughs> that's actually what I said. Um, and uh, so because I, this coming from a guy named Cayman, right? Um, so I remember saying that. He was like, what do you think of the videos? I'm like, wow, this is, this is really good. And so we were looking... Yeah, I'm always looking to network because that's yeah. kind of who I am. So I reached out to Bob and I, I wanted a couple of things from him. First of all, I wanted him to make more videos. And secondly, I wanted him to come to the first Hive Life and speak. Mm. And after talking to him on the phone, I really wanted him to come to Hive Life and speak. And he's become a great friend and just a wonderful resource for everybody. And so, you know, that's that's what it's all about. And we are beekeepers are starting to help each other out a lot more and we're all benefiting from it so uh, i had a question on this person jame I'm, I'm gonna yeah jamie um enjoyed learning from both of you we purchased rocket fuel at hive life does it need to be refrigerated it depends on how long you're going to store it if you're going to have it for a really short period i don't i just keep it outside in, in my shed where it's cool um, but if it's going to be out there for months and months, then it would be best. Definitely, it, these type of things store better when it's either refrigerated or frozen. Someone asked if pollen patties needed to be frozen. I think it's best if you don't have to freeze them. But if you're going to keep them long term, then do freeze them. Because whenever you freeze things and they thaw, it makes them a little bit messier to fool with. But it does preserve the nutrition better than leaving them in, in your room. And then they can dry out, too. 
Yeah, I, I, I've got some that I keep. I've got some from last autumn, still in a big, a big tub, and it's in the cool. Uh, What's in my 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 um in my honey house, which is my my uh, conservatory, but it's been cool and it's perfect still. It's not going over. It's great, and I'm going to be using that myself. So I would have said, you, I think you're absolutely right, totally. Well, if you and can keep it cool. That's better than freezing it. But freezing long term is probably a good thing if you if you're going to not use it for six months. So this question right here: Would you tell us when the videos for Hive Life will be ready to order and where do we pay for them? So. Hive Life's videos will be ready very soon. The, the contract um, states that it will be done here in the next two weeks. And I, wow. I talked to them um, just the other day, and they said they, they seem to be actually a little ahead of schedule. So that's really good. I'll be making a YouTube video announcement and Facebook announcements um, for people to pre-order those. I'm, I'm behind on, on doing the pre-orders, but those uh, who came to the conference will still get the, uh, the conference discounted pricing and the uh, Last year's videos just turned out wonderfully. And, you know, the only issues that we had were kind of twofold this year. Um, you know, you know, Richard kept talking about how amazing Hive Life was, you know, and uh, <laughs> it, it makes me look like I paid him just to come out and push Hive Life. Now, uh, now the actual the biggest problem was um, Dr. David Peck. Um, and we had this issue with him last year, but he's such a, a nice guy and a good presenter. We, we just overlooked it. But the camera guys yet again complained because. Um, he went refused he refused to wear a hat and the glare off of his his bald head was too much for the cameras he had, uh, he had exactly david did a wonderful job for us again and, and we appreciated him because better be wasn't sure if they were going to come to hive life this year and he sweet talked him into coming and and better be had a really nice display this year um they, they went from not having much of anything last year to having a, a wonderful display and so, you know, thanks for, you know, flying all the way from France. There's a lot of work, you know, everything from the the logistics of flying to even uh, payments and airport pickups and, you know, getting you here and back, Richard, was uh, was tricky. But we really appreciated you uh, coming yeah. all the way out here. And, and I think you had a good time. No, but my it, favorite it was, part was getting to hang out with totally... you and Ian and all those guys. It was it was totally worth every second of it because I, I actually love traveling because when I when I get on that on a plane or I go somewhere I kind of love to people what just be part of everything because it's like it, Richard Zing there you are did you lose me there I, I lost you there for a second Back. it actually is helping us um, a okay. little bit because it distorts your face a little bit and it's a little easier um, on our eyes. <laughs> Yeah, so shall I get it right now? Is that better? <laughs> no, I was just no. saying, um, the, w w one of the things I'll comment on, one of the things I'll say, if you guys can hear me still, is that um, the funny was uh, what Natalie, uh, Natalie um, produced a video today, and she put it out this afternoon, and I watched it, and, and as she was going around, I was like, I didn't see that. And I, didn't, I never picked up on that. And it's actually amazing the amount of things you've got to really – kind of do this when you get there and take the there's just so much to take in because there were so many cool vendors there that were really that were really good vendors that wanted to be part of this whole experience you know i like like the um the uh guy selling the instrumental insemination kit yeah APIS that, engineering that was APIS some engineering cool he had that really cool screen that went in front of the, your grafting frame so you could actually enhance what you're viewing. And I, I missed that. And I, I, that's, that's a great thing for YouTubers to have because you could show your grafting. And I was like, oh, I can't believe I missed that, you know. But it's little things like that. And, you know, it's it exciting just, technology. I've never seen yeah. anything like that before. To you know? Totally. And there were so many things there that I thought, you know, for me, this does not – this isn't something I'm interested in. I'm definitely not interested in getting into AI stuff. Um, but I find it totally fascinating. Our Honey Show – um, was the, the the Welsh judges we had did a wonderful job. And the honey show that everybody brought their, whether it was honey or baked goods or candles or whatever it was, it was just a gorgeous display. And, you know, that was, that, I've never even entered a jar in a honey competition before, but I absolutely loved yeah. getting to see it. And, you know, the only part of it I would want to have is to be a judge and get actually do the taste testing. Um, 
I would enjoy that quite a bit. Um, I, it was like, and I actually missed taking photos of it because the, the display against that light, as the light was coming through the window, was uh, quite something else, you know, to behold. It was pretty awesome. You um, know, um, we, uh, we were fortunate. Um, you know, I'm not a tech person at all. I, I know I'm on YouTube, but um, oh gosh, someone's already booked their hotel for 2024. <laughs> um, well, they don't know where it is yet. <laughs> but that's I know, right? Well, probably the same location. That's what we're planning on. Okay. Um, but as far as the, you know, I'm a type of guy that I like hive tools and, you know, pocket knives and smokers, basic stuff like that. But the technology has made it to where you can film a video on that Swinty unit and help me make an informed decision on a several thousand dollar purchase. And, and help others as well. And I'm able to do that. And Bob's able to give us wonderful information. And Ian and several others are doing the same. And Natalie is able to bring us good videos from um, a teenager's, uh, teenage girl's point of view um, and roast Ian along the way. The, the video today where she was roasting Ian, I mean, I would have paid a hundred bucks to have seen that because um, that's my job typically to make fun of Ian. And I'm just, I feel like, you know, I might be out of a job one of these days. Natalie's getting so good at roasting people. I might not be able to um, even compete with her roasting capabilities. Just give her some coffee beans. She can roast that too, I'm sure. Yeah, um, she was awesome in that video she did. She was like, yep, tell me about this. Okay, what about that? Okay, thank you. And everyone's like, oh, um, uh, yeah, it was almost like everyone was afraid of her. She was like really kicking ass. It was great, you know. She was really asking great questions and everyone was really presenting great information. She'd probably deny it all and be very modest and say, you know, oh, no, it took ages. and But she was good. She was really good. Yeah, well, um, we, we definitely um, know Natalie a little bit different because she um, – she when she talks to me she's like well, of course my video was great uh, <laughs> but she she knows that i know that she's being a goofball when she's doing that she is a very humble and, and smart young lady and um but she, but sometimes she takes after me a little bit and she's a little bit of an idiot um and on, on us or on all of us beekeepers like that you know it's, it's, it's all about being goofy but having fun along the way that, that, that's right well and not an idiot is is, is in dumb but is in um being a weirdo and but that's what makes it so fun yeah and, totally. you know and and bob but when when we were sitting at cracker barrel you ian um bob and i and a couple others uh thorn jet thorn was there um byron ferris the guy that does the cream honey was there and uh, bob was bob was being really goofy i i've been around him several times and that was as goofy as i'd ever seen bob and uh he was getting a little animated there and i'm like there's there's he had a little bit of coffee, I think. And I think that caffeine just got him to almost well, it, it was darn good coffee because I had four cups. So I was like, hi, it's a guy. <laughs> That's why you had to keep going to the bathroom. Um, but uh, yeah, crack cracker barrel. Well, it was it was just such a fun experience. And, um, you know, Richard, what we need to do is just have a, like we did the Asian Hornet one. We need to have you on another live chat. Um, where we can just just you and me. Um, I've got to get to some questions and answers. Um, but I appreciate you coming on, Richard, so much. Well, I'd I love to, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have one, you on one of my live chats if you don't mind. In the next yeah. few weeks, be brilliant. Let's let's. Uh, any, I might anything. get about twenty more viewers if I can get you on. That'd be really 20 good. Twenty more viewers. <laughs> A little generous there, but but yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And as far as um, you know, we I appreciate you coming on because right now it's like 1.44 or 12.44 in the morning, your time, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. And so it's yeah. quite early. So I want to let you get that beautiful sleep so you can get back to work. You can see I haven't had my beauty sleep for a long time. It's really telling now. You know? Yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> Life sucks you sometimes, you know. What What do you do? You know, Laurel says I'm starting to get a lot more wrinkles building up up in here on the side. I'm like, I'll just be like a Gordon Ramsay. Just start getting that up there and. And she's like, no, no. Anyways, Richard. Listen, listen, bro, bro, it was awesome. Uh, the whole thing was just, let me just say one more time. The whole thing was an amazing experience. I just want to say uh, one little shout out if I can. Sure. We've got a, a UK beekeeping show in the UK. I don't know if anyone's coming from Europe or from America, but it's called The Beekeeping Show. It's on the 20th. 
6th of February. Uh, it's in the UK. You can look it up. It's called the Beekeeping Show.co.uk. I'm going to be there with two other YouTubers, uh, Griff, uh, Griff, uh, Gwyn and Griffith Honey, Griff Reeves. That is very know. hard to say, man. It is. It is. It's <laughs> Lincoln Welsh <laughs> and another guy, um, um, Lawrence, Lawrence Edwards from Black Mountain Honey. So we're kind of going to be there and we're doing just kind of, a, I think, a, a bit of a Q&A towards the end of it. But the whole thing is, it's going to be one of the kind of biggest events in the UK. Uh, and there's a lot of beekeepers going, so it'll be great to meet loads of people there. But what, what I want to say is I hope loads of people go that are thinking maybe they will, maybe they won't, because you should go, because that's where you pick up and see things. Because there's going to be there's going to be swing tea there. There's going to be Carl Fritz. There's going to be a lot of good European um, beekeeping stock, stock lists and... Um, yeah, a whole cross section. Well, it'll it'll be great, and I will personally fund um, any anybody that goes and and, and needs some um, extra cash to buy a, a bushel basket of tomatoes to hurl at Richard or any of the other guys. <laughs> um, I, I will gladly donate it for those ripe tomatoes. Just make sure that they're um, the non-organic type. I hate to waste good organic tomatoes. So, um, anyhow, um, it's good for your your stand. kindness knows no boundaries, Cayman. You Thank have you, no sir. idea. I, I, this is this is me, thirty four years old, and and starting to act a little bit more mature. So you have no idea. But it, Richard, I do appreciate your um your videos and you, you come into our conference. I appreciate your friendship as well and and the the uh, information sharing how you've been able to help me and um that's that's what this is all about and thank you so much for coming on. Um, just let me know when you want me to come onto your channel and okay, we brilliant. will. Uh, kick some butt and take some names. The only downside is I don't have a tech guy behind like you have. Unfortunately, I'm going to struggle, but I've got to do some some serious catching up. Well, so I might have to borrow your man for a, a bit of online t tutoring. To, well, uh, to The Hive Life Wizard gave a thumbs up. So um, okay, he, awesome. if, if he can swing it, then uh, then then he'll do it. Um, yeah. he, he, he's pretty awesome. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely. Um, very professional. Um, now we're, as I said, we're getting um, fiber optic here imminently, but it's not here yet. And when we get there, that's going to revolutionize all this. I mean, I'm actually going to build a studio in my new honey house. And like you, I'll have like, you know, the French flag behind, but a bigger one than your flag, because I'm going to go into the flag competition. So, <laughs> but it won't be as big as the flag you had at Hive Life. That was pretty impressive. Well, you know, um, see, Ian always, you know, does these things. He starts a lot of it. And and then we kind of have this um, friendly um, rivalry going on, um, and you know I've got this American flag behind me. He has his Canadian flag, and so at Hive Life well, we just have this massive like thirty foot, forty foot flag hanging behind the stage, and I'm just waiting for Ian to see if he can step up to the challenge. I don't think it was, he can. It was pretty impressive. It was pretty impressive, you know, and, and I know you'd ordered it specifically for that, hadn't you? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm always trying to find new ways to um, just bug Ian just a little bit, not in a mean way, but, you know, he gets bored up there in the winter months. As you yeah, can tell I mean, by his videos, he, he's not doing anything. He's sitting no, around he's the fire, drinking he, a little bit of Timmy's yeah, and, yeah. Um, and usually complaining about the wind. Yeah, and, and so, probably walking up and down his, his beehives, muttering to himself rushing as he goes like he always does you know yeah so, i'm just trying to help him out that's what good friends are yeah. for and yeah. uh but richard um <laughs> we're gonna let you go and as soon as you get off then i'm gonna start i um, talking behind your back so um I no, that's cool. you, buddy. i'm and, gonna go um, to bed so i'm gonna put some mufflers on my ears so they don't burn off in the night so <laughs> okay well thanks for coming on richard we'll see you soon yeah, it was awesome to see you and i uh, love to everybody your side okay thanks everybody for all your support and uh Keep supporting Cayman. He's doing a great thing with the conference and all the youth program and all that. It's so impressive. But bye for now. Take care, everybody. Thank See you, you Richard. See you soon. Bye. All right. So we are back. Thanks so much to Richard. He has a great YouTube channel. Um, check it out. There's a lot of nuts and bolts things. And, and the YouTube channels that I recommend the most are always YouTube channels that are guys and gals that are really put in the work sometimes they're not the most polished youtube channels mine's definitely not close to the most polished youtube channel but they're executed from beekeepers who are actually living it and getting it done and i don't feel like are 
are pushing a lot of crazy ideas. And so I'm very conservative with my recommendations, but um, Richard does a great job. Um, and uh, I was very thankful to have him this year at our Hive Life conference because he just uh, brings a lot of energy and excitement and just loves it as much as the rest of us. So I wanna say a big thank you to Rob Searcy, um, donating $50, appreciate you again. Um, helping us out, Rob, and uh, bring on some questions. So that's what we're getting to, um, questions and answers. It is January, February. Let's get to some questions on what we're going to be doing to make this a great beekeeping year. So Lynn says, when will Hive Life 2024 tickets be on sale? Please take my money. Um, I, probably not till May or June, I would say. Something around uh, that realm. And we're, we're starting to think about nucleus colonies right now. I need to get a couple employees, apparently, to be able to manage all of this crazy stuff. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm so far behind on so much work. It's it's not intentional. It's just we are slammed, slammed. If there was three of me, I might be able to keep up with the opportunities right now. And I'm trying to get Laurel to back off a little bit on the work because it's just been it's been really borderline abuse the last couple of years, how hard that we've worked. And it's time to get back to family. It's time to get back to um, a little bit more just focusing on other things besides bees. And I mean, I, that sounds wrong, doesn't it? But, but you know, I've got a couple of kiddos that need some time and, and all that kind of stuff. So let's get to these questions. Um, let's see. Tennessee's bees, I picked up a barbecue full of hive and bees. Should I split them now or wait till March? They are bringing in pollen, but I'm worried about absconding thoughts. So I don't understand the barbecue bit. So maybe you found them in a grill or a barbecue unit and you, you pulled them out. So you're thinking about when to pull them out. Depends on what you're seeing. If you're already getting pollen and especially if you're getting nectar, then yes, that's a good time of the year to be pulling them out. Whenever I, excuse me, was doing cutouts or anything like that, but especially cutouts. I know that my season, my bees look pretty strong in late March and they usually don't start swarming till the end of March to early April at the earliest. So if I was going to pull bees out of something for my area, I would do it right before then. I don't want them swarming on me, but I also want them strong and healthy when I do the cutout. And I also want the temperatures to be as warm as possible to make it as least uh, stressful. And I would always use an insulated like Apame hive or something like that if I had one. Um, so that helps them regulate the temperature um, a lot better in that cavity. But I don't know which, where you're at, but that would help a lot. Question, when is Cayman actually going to grow a beard? Um, answer, probably never. Um, I can't grow a super good one anyways. And Laurel does not like a beard on me at all and says that if I grow one, then I will have to make my own dinner and I won't be getting any kisses. And man, I love those kisses. So I mean, I, I ain't growing no beard. And I definitely like to eat. Um, but honestly, I just don't like it. I don't like it. I, I, I'd like keeping it shaved off. Um, Cayman, when is the major nectar flow in your part of Tennessee? So there's a few different major flows and it depends on where you're at to a degree. In my area of Tennessee, if you have autumn olive, another wonder, wonderful invasive, it begins in the early part of April, and that is the first big jump of nectar. So that will really kick swarm season off. That's the first jump towards swarming. Hard jump is autumn olive nectar, and that's compounded a little bit with some red bud nectar and a few other contributors as well. And then some of the other big sources of nectar. Poplar is kind of hit and miss. And black locust is kind of falls in that category too. They'll, they'll be like, usually there's a little bit, but it's like a strong little spurt. And then because we'll get a windy or a rainy day and it just beats them up or we'll get a late frost and then it'll get them. So those are kind of 50, 50, but you kind of got to watch those. Um, the blackberry blossom is my personal favorite, more consistent, the blackberry nectar is just the supreme nectar. And it just, it's very consistent, nice little brownish black pollen coming from it as well. 
and then a basswood clover flow towards the end of the season. So we get multiple surges, but the majority of our honey that we produce in our operation comes over a six to eight week period. If it's a great year, we will have eight weeks of good flow. But in an average year, it's more around six to seven. And in a bad year, it can be four to five. And that's rare. But uh, you have to have strong bees ready to produce because we can produce over 100 pounds a colony in my area if the bees are where they need to be and we have drawn comb. And we can average that. In an average year, we will get close to 100 pounds on average off of a good colony. So, and, and we should. But the bees have to be ready to go. So we have several major nectar flows, but it's a short period and we've got to get it while the getting is good. Question about honey supers. I've got eight or so with drawn combs and 30 with foundation. This year I'm looking to get more comb drawn. Do I mix in drawn combs with foundation to better entice the bees up? So what I would do, Cobra Strike, is take a couple of those combs out, two of them, and then I would put two foundations. I think if you add too much more to that, you're, you're slowing them down too much, in my opinion. So I'd have the foundations butted up against each other and, and then have the combs off to the side because the bees will draw the foundation in the center better than they will towards the outer. There's different opinions on this, but um, so I would have, so let's say you have nine in there. You have two foundations, seven combs, then the next box two foundations seven combs and then i'd have foundation that would bring in once the bees have started drawing um, those foundations a little bit and those filling up those combs i would bring in a box of foundation and put underneath those because they'll draw it better close to the brood chamber and then if they've drawn those other foundations out that you put two in those pull those back out um, or pull one of them out leave one in and you can either put another foundation in there and you can when you put that box of foundation that solid box of foundation you can actually remove those that they've started put that in that box and just exchange it and that'll help them start that new box of foundation but it's tricky getting a uh, lot of, of combs drawn out but i would mix it in some people will checkerboard them a little bit more but I don't like to do that very much. If you're going to be aggressive with it, I would put two in the center, you know, combs, and then have foundations um, close to the outside. But we, we want them to really still commit to storing nectar in those and have enough room. We, we don't ever want to see that nectar push down to the brood chambers at all unless we want to have bees start going to the, the swarming uh, stimuli phase. <laughs> Kama, what is your opinion on styrofoam hive bodies, good or bad? I'm in Arkansas. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming on, Edward. So I have several um, poly hives. Um, it's EPS. It's you styrofoam for short, but um, it is very similar, but it is very dense. And they're very popular in a lot of places outside of the U.S. And in some parts of the U.S., they are gaining popularity. There are pros and cons. So I now have some paradise boxes. I have um, some of the high of IQ that was at the conference is all EPS. They, the, the bees really do well in them. Bad bees are going to die in them, though. I mean, that's for sure. Uh, but the bees definitely will brood longer and start quicker brooding into those colonies. And they can take a heck of a lot more abuse. You have a cold snap, and it just does not affect them the same in those type of boxes. They are more expensive. They the paradise boxes i found that the, the bee space is not quite right so the finland um boxes the, the paradise brand um in my experience with them they'll glue the frames they'll propolize the top frames down to the bottom ones and i, I don't like that one bit because then you're trying to pry that up and force these frames down and it's a chore even if you've got a decent bit of a core strength and so that's it's terrible maybe it's just a, a compatibility issue with the man lake frames but bees do very well in them they're not as rugged obviously there's a price tag but that my bees do great in summer in them too they don't hardly beard at all the conservation of resources is real i mean it's just like our houses 
If you have single pane windows and no insulation in your walls, I used to live in a house like that. So this isn't me just guessing. This is this is experience. Your energy bill is massively different than in an insulated house with double paned windows and doors that are insulated. So uh, it does the same thing for the bees. They burn significantly less honey in the summer to cool it down and significantly less resources need to go through winter. If I was running a smaller operation, I would consider going all to that because of the cost savings long term on having to feed. And, and also there's some advantages to honey production. Um, I don't know to what extent, but I, there's got to be some and I, I, it looks like it to me. So next question. All right. I got a message on jar pricing. Let's see here. This is in Columbia, Tennessee. Two pound, 12 counts. Gosh. Pretty good pricing uh, for for uh, this day and age. Um, I like the pricing before all this stupidity happened and uh, the prices went through the roof. Um, all right. Qu Chris, we got another question. Cayman, have you heard anything about the AFB vaccine that is in, in the works? Been out of the loop for a while and saw something. I, I've seen a little bit on it. I've talked to Bob about it a little bit. Bob Benny is fixing to have a video with Keith Delaplane on the AFB vaccine. I'm going to be watching that video. And I suggest you do the same if you want to know. AFB is not a big deal in Tennessee. I mean, if it, if, it, if you get it, it's a big deal. But I don't know. I've, I've known buddies in beekeeping for way over a decade. None of them have ever had it. I've never had it. It's never been close to me. I don't see why I should need it, why I should put money into it. I think it's something that can be controlled the way that we are doing it. I would be more concerned about something that addressed varroa mites and people are like, well, these are serious issues too. Well, maybe they are for some people, but I know a lot of beekeepers. I mean, guys with 10,000 hive, 2,000 hive, 3,000, they seem to be fine without it. Keeping your combs fairly young, you know, no more than 10 years on a brood comb, you know, keeping your bees healthy goes a long way. Our bees are more hygienic towards these things now than they used to be. And we probably can thank Faroa a little bit to that because it has made our, it has been more stressful on our bees and, and made our bees better. But I don't know. I'm, I'm, I hate to be a Debbie Downer, but I just don't see this being something that's monstrously useful. I mean, even EFB and chalk brood, we've eliminated in our operation with selective breeding. And, you know, Michael Palmer, Bob Benny, of these people do the same. A lot of guys like Corey Stevens with VSH, that's part of the characteristic, those traits of hygienic behavior, keep AFB, EFB, and a lot of these things suppressed and keep the highest cleaner. So I don't know. I, it's not something that I'm just like, oh man, I cannot wait for this product. I want a Varroa soul crushing product. That's what I want. I think that's where 90% of the research needs to go. If it's not in Varroa, it's got, it needs to be in nutrition or better queens for Varroa. Um, those are the big ones right there. Okay, ran over. What is the signs that a hive can be split? Where do you get queens early in the season? So I raise a lot of my own queens, and so I don't get them as early. I do have some friends that I get queens from, and basically in order to get on the early list, somebody has to die. So if you can you know, basically get where I am, like right behind me on the list and then kill me, then you can bump up into my spot. That's based, that's how much in demand these guys, uh, queens are. If you're, if you're getting good ones, if you're getting some of like the commercial Georgia Queens, um, you can get some of them early, but they're not that good. Uh, 20 to 30% of them are just poor Queens. That's bad. hundred Queens. And 20% of them are going to be no good or more, sometimes 30%. Um, yeah. So early queens is a, a bit of a tricky one. I prefer to overwinter nucleus colonies with my own queens as backups. And so I know what I'm getting. And, and, and that's how I deal with it. Now, what are the signs that a hive can be split? It needs to be healthy and powerful. I want to see 
really a, a good at least six to eight frames of brood and there needs to be a lot of bees in there i don't i'm not one of those guys i used to be this guy that you know just splits and splits and splits but small hives are more vulnerable i really don't like going into winter with less than a five frame cluster um, on the low end and I, I definitely like keeping my my bees strong that makes them more resilient to anything i mean any pests anything so on a double deep sized hive i don't want to split that thing unless i've got at least 14 to 15 frames of bee coverage and then that, that's a good size to split um i i wouldn't go much smaller than that all right whoa i have missed a lot of questions over here what is the best tree to plant for the ladies to gather pollen and nectar i'm in south louisiana so very little winter here Ooh, it really depends on your season so for example there are some plants that i have considered planting here that you that will produce pollen and nectar the problem is a lot of these plants also coincide with some of our biggest flows so why would why would you want to plant something that would be going on during clover or blackberry blossom it's not that it's bad but it's not crazy beneficial because the bees can only do so much now if that crop fails and yours doesn't well then that's a great backup but ideally if we're going to spend so much time nurturing a plant obviously we're going to go for something that's in a dearth period either prior to our flows or after i don't really know what your season's like um i really like basswood trees i don't know if they'll grow that far south um very well i, I think they do but i don't know basswood is a great end of season huge nectar producer high quality nectar it takes a while fantastic wood now, basswood's a great one if you're needing something early black locust it starts the season good mm, you can plant buckwheat later in the season but if you're wanting something that's kind of long term um avodia trees um, or b b trees b e e b e e um, trees are are beautiful trees that produce in august um down where you're at there's some invasives that they're trying to maybe eradicate like tallow um that are great i wish we had a nectar flow like that up here so i don't really know your season so in your buckwheat videos how many acres did your dad plant did you let the fields reseed themselves do you still feel positive buckwheat produces for your fall flow thanks so donovan we didn't plan enough to really significantly impact our fall flow i really don't take honey ever in our fall flows i've tinkered around with it it's never worth the effort however i do find that there are benefits to planting clover and buckwheat during these dearth periods because it's stressful on our bees and it's really not so much about gains but it's, it's more about supplementing our bees and getting them nutrition and keeping them healthy through the rough as part of our season winter is not hard here in tennessee what's hard is late july august early september if the flow is not good you know early july can be very rough as well and we can have in a very dry year three months of dearth of no nectar and very very little pollen that's stressful on the bees it's more stressful than the winter is for sure and so anything that we can do to alleviate and help our bees that's why we feed them through that period and that's also why we plant so my dad planted i think around an acre plus of buckwheat it definitely impacted the colonies they definitely wanted to rear more brood and looked nice nectar coming into the colony has shown to make your bees not only live a little bit longer but also more hygienic they're going to go through and clean the hive better everything's just better and ripening nectar creates hydrogen peroxide so that makes a lot of sense in helping keep the bees healthier too but um i don't know how many acres we would have to plant to be able to get loaded supers and i guess it depends on how many colonies that you have i usually run 30 to 40 production colonies to a yard so it would take several acres um, we did let it reseed and every year we we'll, you know this coming year i guarantee you that we'll have some buckwheat from last year um volunteer and come back up not a ton but a little bit all right next question really enjoyed hive life what do you think of the man lake 
OHB Saskatraz packages. I've never tried Man Lake's um, stuff. Um, the Olivares um, Saskatraz, if I, if, I, if, I, if I got that right. I've heard really good things about them. I've only had two of them. And the two that I got were very disappointing. I, I know the genetics are, are good. I, I've talked to enough people who I trust that have used them that like them. The biggest problem is when buying commercial early packages is not, but most of the time it's not a genetic thing. It's, you know, people talk about all these genetics from Georgia and these genetics from California, which is, I think, where those are coming from. But honestly, it's more about quality. And these queens not, are not getting mated properly. They're not allowed to lay properly. Everything's messed up in a stressful environment. I'm not trying to, it's not that you can't get a good one. But that's the biggest problem with ordering. And that's why I raise my own queens is I just I just get rid of all that drama because the, the genetics might be good, but the quality might not be great. And I think that's what happened is when I ordered those Saskatraz queens, they just didn't perform like great queens. They didn't. So that was my only experience with the Saskatraz was kind of like, eh, they weren't as good as the ones that I raised myself. And uh, my, my kind of my standard for queens is either my queens, uh, the queens that I purchased from Michael Palmer or Bob Benny or Chris Warner. But all of those guys are like upper echelon queen rearers and they, they do it the right way. They don't rush the process and they do smaller batches compared to these big operations. And um, it definitely shows very hard to get on the list. All right. In what month the queen starts laying an egg after the great period of winter in northern areas of USA? So in northern north areas of USA, hmm. So it just really depends on where you're at. Um, she will she could be laying eggs now in, in some northern parts, but they'll cannibalize the eggs if they don't have the nutrition to sustain that. And a lot depends on if it's Italian bees or carnies or Russian bees, but my uh, fella who's helping me, Chris, uh, the Hive Life Wizard, he's up in northern Ohio, and it's it's been really cold up there. They're really not re rearing a lot of brood. So there's a lot of variables. Bees really don't want to raise brood until pollen hits. They'll raise a little bit here and there, but once that first real pollen hits, it is off to the races as much as they can afford. They're going to rear brood. Laurel said, hi, if you guys might be selling nukes this year, do you know yet if you will? Yes, we will, St. Germain. Um, I will be putting a list together. Um, I'm That's one of my goals, actually, over the next couple of days is to have that finished by um, and determine how many we're going to sell. So we were getting in bees today and looking at where we were at. I'll have some videos posted of that as well and, and see how many we're going to sell. And they're going to take orders and they will probably go really fast, but um, I will send you a message and, and just be on the lookout for that. It'll be on YouTube and, and Facebook and, and all that jazz. And you just fill out a very easy form. Um, it's going to be way, way nice. And the nukes um, should, hopefully will be with as early as this season is um, ready sometime in the latter part of April. Sometimes we've had to push it to the first week of May. I'm hoping with the way things are shaping up, we'll have them. I'm a little earlier this year, so that would be nice. Of course, we say that now. Let's see what happens in February and March. But <laughs> if you heard anything about this UBO unhealthy brood order, odor that um, Dr. Wagner has been working on, they are supposed to have a test out next year for this trait. Oh, yeah, I have heard about it quite a bit, and I'm really anxious to see more information about it. When it gets guys like Bob and Michael Palmer and Queen Rears like Corey Stevens, um, excited it gets me excited i don't know as much as those guys in regards to hygienic testing um, but i know michael palmer does hygienic testing and anything that we can do to make that process and that that is primarily what this spray is for um that that she has created is to be able to spray and get them to uncap and be able to do hygienic tests much faster much more accurate and, and if this actually will do that then it'll be so much better on our queen breeders and also for us small guys who are considering it. And the, the anything that we can do to make 
genetic testing quicker and better is just awesome. So I'm all about that. Came in any input on the eco wood treatment for boxes better than paint. Would love to get um, set up to do wax dipping, but just not worth it for a small operation at this point. Hey, I totally hear you on that. The eco wood treatment is okay. I've, I've had a couple boxes of it now. The wood still swells. It does retard rotting, but you still get some absorption of water and the wood swells. And I hate that. Um, so it's okay. I, I'm not really a fan of it, to be honest. Now, something I have not tried, and I wonder how well this would work, is if you dipped your boxes in it, because it does retard um, rotting, if you dipped boxes in it, let them dry for a decent period, and then you primed and painted it, how well that would work? I don't know. I never heard anybody to do that. Honestly, if I was going to go the painting route, I would do what Bob Benny does. Copper napathate, the stuff stinks. It is proven. It works. Focus on all the edges um, on the outside, all the, the end grain. Get that soaked up with that copper nap. It stinks. So you want to give it about a month to air out. But then you paint over that. And those boxes can literally last 15, 20, I've heard decades on those. So it's worth it to go the extra mile. This is something I wish I would have done earlier, but there's equipment that I could still be using that I assembled 15 years ago. You know how much cheaper boxes were 15 years ago? So take the extra time, everybody, and preserve your equipment very well. Focus on that end grain, the edges where the boxes sit on each other. Um, do what you can to preserve it. It's worth the extra effort and the labor and the money that you're going to save. Hey, Cayman, are there any drawbacks using nine frame brood, uh, nine frames in a 10 frame deep? So running a double deep, that would be 18 frames. Currently using 10, but looking for options to reduce comb thinning next to mite treatment strips, New Zealand. All right. I used to run all of my operation like that, and there's nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. It was extremely common and still is extremely common in a lot of professional operations um, because throughout your your business, if you're running a thousand hives and you reduce each box and you have two of them, that's 2,000 boxes by one, then you have 2,000 frames less that you're going to require in that operation to still operate. I mean, so and if you're paying three bucks a frame times 2,000, it's three bucks for a loaded frame with foundation, that's $6,000. Yeah, $6,000 in savings right there doing that. There's nothing wrong with it at all. The only thing and the reason why I have gone back to tens is if you're wanting to do single brood management, which I have switched to, you want to have in that single brood chamber 10 frames because you want that queen to have that whole extra frame delay. And it, it just makes a, a lot of sense. So what I've been doing is running when I'm in singles, it's 10 frames in, in the deep box under the excluder. And then when the season's over, we pull that excluder, we pull up a frame of eggs into the next deep that's going to have eight frames and a two frame frame feeder. So it's a two gallon mother load frame feeder. Love everything from mother load. Um, gosh, they're made so heavy and, and they're made here in the USA. Very affordable. Um, but that's how I do it. But there's nothing wrong with it. I've, I've spent most of my beekeeping running nine frames in there and I never saw any issues with the bees whatsoever. It's just a management uh, tactic. But try it out and then let me know what you think about it. All right, scrolling down to some questions. All right. How is Corey Stevens Queens doing? Are you going Italian? I would prefer Carney. Um, definitely prefer Carney. Italians try to rear too much brood in winter for my liking. And um, the, the, you just it's harder to kill mites in Italian hives. But if, if I would love if Corey Stevens would get like a VSH Carney line, that would be cool for me. However, um, the, the Queens seem to be doing fine. However, I have not had a full year of production and, and mite reproduction to determine that. And that's what I really need. I need to know, are these VSH queens spending a lot of time producing genetics that are going to still make me honey? 
and that are going to make new bees to be able to sell nukes in? And are they actually going to be able to suppress those mites at a decent rate? Because, I mean, if it's a little bit, well, that's great. But if I'm losing 20% in honey production, like the old VSH, then that's not worth it to me. So there's trade-offs in beekeeping. Um, Corey's an awesome guy, though, and I have high hopes for these things, but that's that's kind of where I'm at right now. So Saskatraz hybrids is what Man Lake sells. Yeah, they used to do that with the Russian hybrids, and the, I did not like those queens at all. They were terrible. Um, basically, you didn't even know what you had, and they were very aggressive. And sometimes when you mix these hybrids, you end up with an aggressive bee. Is the only reason to feed sugar water to bees instead of honey would be cost? Um, no, there's a lot of other reasons to do it. It's because in like Canada, North Dakota, these cold weather areas, they do this in very cold regions of Europe. It, bees actually overwinter better on sugar syrup than they do on honey. Some honeys, especially fall honeys, have a lot of mineral content. And when it's cooked down, a lot of ash content. And so as the bees are consuming this over several months in winter, this ash content builds up into their guts and can cause a lot of gut related problems because they haven't been able to take a cleansing flight. In the south, like in Tennessee and further south, we get so many cleansing flights throughout the winter. We can put all kinds of weird stuff in our feeds. A lot of it we don't even need to. We just, I guess we feel good using it. And it doesn't matter because our bees will be able to get a cleansing flight and, and poop it out of their system. But in the north, if you did some of the stuff that we're doing in the south, you're going to kill your bees. You got to be careful with these YouTubers now because they'll tell you to mix all this stuff up into your uh, northern feeds and it can cause some issues. Clean feed is important. So uh, sugar syrup can actually be better in some cases to overwinter your bees on. It is cheaper and there's also a cleansing effect when you feed sugar syrup to your bees. It also creates hydrogen peroxide like nectar does. Not quite as good, but it helps your bees clean their systems out, flush out any pathogens that could be in their gut, cleans the cells as it's ripening in the cell. And also as bees are getting fed, they're happier and they are more hygienic. So feeding bees has a lot more benefits. We cannot correlate sugar being bad for humans to sugar being bad for bees. It's, it's not like that. Cane and, and beet sugar um, are best granulated white refined sugars. Um, high fructose corn syrup is does do some damage to bees. It's, it's totally different. Can you run eight frame supers without much trouble? So yes, you can. I've actually experimented with this a good bit. Um, I was running eight combs. So what you do, for those of you who don't know, your first year in like a medium super, if it's foundation, you have to put 10 frames in there. If you don't, it's at your own peril because they'll make all kinds of weird comb and bridge comb. But once you get those 10 frames drawn or once they're mostly drawn, you can pull one of those out and then go to nine frames. And this makes it to where the combs are fatter, way easier to uncap, and you've saved 10% on your cost. But what if you were to go to eight frames in a 10 frame box, get an eight frame spacer, which they make and space those out. Then you'll get super fat combs and it does work. And this is one way you guys can, if you don't have quite enough combs and honey supers, you can go to eight and get these super fat combs. But I had to switch back to nines because I started using a cow and silver queen on capper. And as it's going through there, it has a like spring system, and if there is really fat combs on one side and not as much, it will put more pressure. As this side pushes, it pulls more on that side and digs in deeper. And so what you'll find is you'll get bridge comb. So you have two combs here and the bees, because there's more room, they will bridge in between. It's not that bad if you're using an uncapping knife, but if you're using a cow and silver queen, even if it's just a bridge piece that big, it'll push on one side and just cut way deep in that other frame. But you can, yes, use eight frames and a medium super. Just make sure they're spaced evenly and that your combs are already drawn when you do so. All right, so here's a question. Hey, Matt, good to see you. My plan this year is to finally raise my own queen. has been re-watching your and Bob's uh, Queen uh, video series. Thank you so much. For those of you who don't know, you can go to my main YouTube page. You can hit playlists and then you can find categories. So if you want to see small hive beetle stuff or anything like that, it's awesome to be able to just go to what you need instead of having to search through 500 videos. 
and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, the small hive beetle traps that we tested out this year were great. They're still holding up awesome, even at being out in the hive all year. Baiting them with pollen patties works wonderfully because you're able to open up those um, little small hive beetle traps, put a little bit of oil in them. Um, some people will put beer in them because uh, they do really like light beer. So they must all be males, apparently. Um, and <laughs> I can't help myself. I, I, I've, I've never had a beer before in my house, so I, I don't, I've never tested that one. I might actually test that one out this year, uh, putting that in, see how well attracted. But I do know that small high beetles love pollen patties. So this year we tried a couple of different things, some fruits and pollen patties, and just, it made sense. They were really attracted to the pollen patties and would go in there and seek out the trap and drown in, in the oil. But yeah, um, you guys can go to those playlists and find that out. So I saw you pointing at me, Chris. So I, I the message was read loud and clear. All right. Let's see here. Going through some questions. So what are the things that we're prepping to do? Let's get into some of that real quick. So we are just starting to see the first bits of brood. Great frames of brood. It's awesome um, to see this much brood this time of the year, I think. It, it's exciting. I don't. We'll see in the, the long term if it's good. But what are the things that we're going to be doing? Because we're going through colonies right now like, whoa, this one's got two, two and a half frames of brood already. This is going to be a whopper. And then there's some that are a little bit behind, but the queens are laying good patterns and they're good queens. So we are going to be doing equalizing uh, probably in the next month, especially in March. March is a big month of equalizing. And that's where we go through these yards of 30 to 40 colonies. And, whoa, this one's getting too big. It's going to start swarming early. Pull a frame or, or two of brood out and plug it into other colonies that are a little bit behind and balance the yards out so that when we're going in, all the work is very similar. So when we're adding supers, they all need it. And that's part of running a, a, a decent sized amount of bees is trying to equalize your colonies to where the work is all very uniform as much as can be done. And that will help those little guys get to where they can make a full honey crop and, and the big colonies will keep them from swarming. So that's something that we're looking at and you can do and you're like, wow, this colony's got a good laying queen but there's only about three frames of brood. I wish they were a little bit ahead. Ooh, this colony is early for our honey flow. Pull out a frame or two, give them that other colony. You're helping keep that one from wanting to swarm and getting this one ready to produce some honey. It, it's a great tool to equalize bees. And no, we're not paper combining. When you're doing this, when there's pollen and nectar coming in, combining bees is very easy. You do this during robbing season when there's no nectar or no pollen or both coming in, then that's a good way to start some robbing. If you're not careful, you can still combine bees, but it's a, it's, it's a lot trickier that time of the year. Do you pull nukes before equalizing? No, we actually equalize first and then we pull nukes um, afterwards. We pull nukes before the honey flow and cut them back so that they don't want to swarm on that first rush of nectar and pollen. And since we have combs, they start going up into the honey supers and putting that nectar up in there instead of putting it in the brood chamber. And it really works well to retard um, any swarming. We'll be trying to do more videos on that. Came okay, I'm in southern middle Tennessee on the river, and we have been seeing new, new bees for about a week now. How long have you been seeing them? Um, they just, today was my first day seeing fuzzy young bees. It looks like they've, I've had a, a few days of bee emergence, maybe a week in the biggest colonies, but yeah, we're starting to see that. And that's a little early, but welcome to agriculture, I suppose. Um, it, it, they're looking good and that's really all that matters. A little bit of pollen patties to try to smooth in any bad weather that we might get will help out. But I'm glad to hear that you're seeing that and you're in Southern Mid Middle Tennessee. So you're probably five to seven days ahead of me at least. Um, hope you have a great bee season. I love Tennessee beekeeping. Matt says, I've been using the global pollen patties with the rocket fuel that I got at Hive Life. The bees love it. 
Can't wait to see the highs in early spring, split, split, split. Yeah, just try to keep ahead of them. Um, I don't recommend near the stuff that I could. Um, I have companies that solicit me like literally every day and a lot of garbage stuff. Um, I try to be very careful with what I recommend to you guys because I don't like to buy crap and I don't want somebody selling or recommending crap to me. Um, however, the, the rocket fuel is um, great stuff. On, on the video I released today, um, you can buy the mix to mix into your AP23 powder to make your own patties or your Ultra B. It is a supplement to the pollen patty stuff that you make, or you can order um, it custom if you buy like six pallets or more. So I, I, I don't use that much pollen pad. I don't use that much stuff. But Hive Life, they were available. And you can buy the product. It's made by Apis Biologics, but nutrition is fundamental to keeping our bees healthy. When bees have a lot of nutrition, they can withstand more Varroa mites and all of that kind of stuff. So having a great queen and, and good nutrition really helps our bees resist a lot higher pressures and stressors. And then as a beekeeper, we do our best to reduce the stressors too. And then if we bring all those things together, then we have big bees that we need to split in August and July and try to keep them from swarming in spring. Brood, huh? New, new bees. We just got eight more inches of snow on top of two feet left from December. Holy cow. So jealous of your agricultural zone. Well, Clive, we appreciate you taking all that snow and keeping it way up there so we don't have to deal with it. So appreciate that. Someone's got to take it. We appreciate you being willing to do that for us. <laughs> No, I hope that your bees overwinter good. And I actually would like to get a little bit more snow. Um, I love to ski. Um, I love to ice skate. Um, I just I just love how quiet and beautiful snow is. But I'm sure you get sick of it as much as you have to deal with it. Came and I have some colonies that are near a sawmill. Man says bees are all over the sawdust. Any thoughts? Great question. So I've had some issues with one of the neighbors um, to one of my bee yards calling the, the guy and saying, hey, these bees are messing with my chicken feed and my bird seed and all that. And the, when there is a dearth of real pollen and it's warm enough for the bees to fly, bees are very industrious. They are going to go and capitalize on everything that they can. And that is why you cannot say that, well, bees will stop taking feed whenever they decide they don't, they don't need any more. The only time that I've ever seen bees not take feed is when there's such a strong honey flow. They don't have time to take both of them. And I've seen that. But as soon as that flow is done, the next day they're going to take that sugar syrup, even if they've got 200 pounds of honey in the hive. So what they're doing is during that dearth, they're trying to find anything that resembles food and work it and bring it into to the hives. And sawdust, since it's so powdery and small sometimes, it can resemble pollen and they'll bring it in and they'll go, hey, what about this? And they'll like, what the heck are we going to do with that? Throw it out. But they try. Hey, Rainer, um, we talk trash about you old guys in the youth beekeeper sponsorship all the time. Mostly you came in. Ah, well, thank you so much. So uh, Rainer's one of the uh, the young men from the youth sponsorship. Um, he's really not that young. Um, I, sometimes I, I say kids, but most of them are, are teenagers or are pushing um, you know, being in their 20s. So uh, we appreciate you coming on. We appreciate you coming to Hive Life and we're glad to have you because there's a lot of opportunities in this industry. It takes a lot of work. Um, I'm not going to lie to anybody. It's not any different than getting a welding job or like I used to do truck driving and, and carpentry, um, construction. It's, it's a lot of work being an, an adult. But if you start at your age and start eliminating and you, you start doing the hard stuff when you're young, it will make it easier when you're older. And you'll also more likely be able to do what you like to do. And whether that's running a successful sideline or, or turning beekeeping into a business, um, you can totally do it. I think maybe in some ways there's more opportunity in beekeeping now than there ever has because we have all this technology to be able to advertise our honey and our creamed honeys and we have all this education available and and let's face it guys my age and up we're not really in on all the tech i think there's a lot of opportunity to incorporate technology and in beekeeping and whether it's some selling honey or heck making products like uh 
this product right here. Um, both of these products right here, this is um, a Thorn eight gallon wax melter. I'm fixing to do a video on it. And this is made by Jed Thorne. He's um, younger than I am. I, I think he's 30, 29, something like that. So he's a young guy. Um, and and he, he builds these here in the US and they started a, a great company building just awesome pieces of equipment. And that's just um, some great welds. And this thing, if you're in a knife fight or a sword fight, this is a, a secondary um, you know, defense weapon you can have to whatever you're using as an offensive weapon. It's fantastic. Or just hit them with it. It'll work too. I'm a very uh, weird guy. I just, I just realized how violent that sounded. Mm. And so while we're speaking about blowing things away, um, we have this uh, new device that's made um, by Janos. And this is just such a nice vaporizer. I love the ones that I have. And, you know, this technology, there's so much opportunity for young men and women to develop product that we need in this industry. The time is now. So, you know, it's it's an exciting time. And I just about put that up in there without the lid on. That would have been quite the, the bang. All right. So which product of Apis Biologics are you calling rocket fuel? So you have the biocontrol, which is for the nectar feeding, and then you have activator, I believe it is, which is for the pollen. So um, definitely use the activator for that. I call them both rocket fuel because um, uh, they're the best supplements that we have for sugar syrup and pollen patties and, and really give our bees an edge when they need it. It's, it's not a cure-all. There's no such thing as a cure-all in beekeeping, but this actually targets things that bees already have in pollen and nectar. It's not creating something new like some oregano oil or some type of you know thing outside of beekeeping and bringing in. That doesn't mean they're all bad, but this is something that bees have needed since bees started being. So it, it's a good product. Kimberly Schmidt, I'm looking to purchase an oxalic acid vaporizer this spring. Do you have any suggestions, Cayman? So um, I really like the products from um, Rob, um, Laura B Vaporizers. I've done a few videos on their different models. This is one of the models that they sell. This is um, a more expensive model. It's battery operated. So with the battery in the unit, it can be um, quite expensive. Um, it's very awesome if you have the batteries and enough bees to justify it. But he also has models that are plug-in and, and they're much cheaper. <clears throat> I would recommend one of those. The customer service is, is very good as well. And if you have any issues, the, the couple of people, the only few that I've heard of the like thousands of units that they've sold um, have always been very satisfied with them um, follow up and, and Rob being able to immediately address your issues. So I, I would look no further than um, Laura B. Vaporizer. Um, they, they do a great job. And I've got several videos on them if you'd like to see how, how they do. You know, Rob's another one of those young guys. He's in his mid-20s bringing value to the industry. Absolutely love it. Lots of opportunity. Came in here um, in Ohio, the crab apple bloom signifies full go for a queen rearing. Um, do you have something similar in your neck of the woods? Um, my timing for queen rearing is I don't really look at it from a pollen standpoint because um, we feed pollen patties so much um, on the colonies that we're wanting to rear queens from, but just kind of a, a time of the year. This year, if things continue to be early, I will start raising queens the third week of March. Um, if it starts getting cooler and the weather doesn't look good, I'll wait till about the 1st of April. Um, to do that. I also want to see drones. So um, the crab apple bloom sounds you know, right though. We do have crab apple around the time that we start raising queens uh, down here as well. So there's a lot of triggers that beekeepers can learn and utilize to, to, to have kind of a system of when we start doing things. And, and it varies a little bit by how warm the season begins. Uh, Cayman, I thought you mentioned somewhere that you mix in your pro that you mix in propolis in your sugar syrup to feed back. Can you expand on that? So, um, no, I've never used propolis in a sugar syrup mix to feed um, back to bees. Now, Chris Warner, who is one of our speakers this year, um, he actually has a way of taking propolis 
and mixing it into his pollen patties. Um, but I don't know anything about that, that myself. I, I've never fed back propolis in, um, to my colonies. Now I will take pollen and feed that into pollen patties. Cayman, do you know of any companies that sell migratory lids with feeding shims built in? Dadent does on their migratory lids, but it's a really thin one. It's too thin. Um, I, I've The ones that I have are half inch. I think theirs are a 16th thinner than that. And I, I actually kind of wish mine were thicker. I've, I've contemplated going to three quarter inch shims. And the reason for that is because it just it allows me to do so much more um, up up in the top. I will get burr comb and some stuff during the spring flow. But the way I look at it, what you can do to prevent that is let's say that you're stacking up your honey supers. Well, put an extra box, once the weather's warmed up, put an extra box of foundation on top. And then if they get past all your comb, then they'll hit that box of foundation and they'll start working on that before they build on the lid or at least uh, mostly avoid it. But then once we get into the dearth period or this time of the year, they're not going to build a bunch up there. And I, I like the feeder rims, but to answer your question, I really don't know of a lot of companies that are are building the shims properly. And honestly, I, I didn't care for the ones I got from Data. They were a little bit too lightweight. Josh from Temple, Texas conference. I'm awake. I'm finding dead bees loaded with pollen in front of my hive. Sound like poison to you. Hmm. If you're finding a lot of them, then it could be. If it's just a few of them, sometimes the bees run out of gas. Um, that pollen weight's heavy and it's cool and they drop down and they miss the hive and then they just die of exposure. So are you seeing 10? Are you seeing five? Are you seeing 50 to 100? Um, if I'm seeing a lot of them, I'm concerned. I just, um, the only the only thing I could figure in that case would be if you're close to an agricultural field where they're spraying off the fields to, to prep and whatever is blooming in that field the bees are gathering from, and that could be it. Um, I, I don't really know. 20 or so per hive, thanks. Keep an eye on it. Honestly, at this point, what I'm going to, my next step would be going into the hives and looking at the brew because if there is poison, in the pollen, some of that's going to make it in and see if the brood patterns are uniformly um, set up in the colony or are we seeing spotty stuff and and then bees, you know, it, it, the, if it's taking it out on the brood patterns, then you know you got some type of toxic stuff in, in the hive. Keep me posted on that. I haven't ever dealt with that before myself, so I'd like to learn. All right, folks. So we have reached uh, over an hour and a half, which was kind of my goal. I'm, ha I'm having to keep these a lot shorter for a couple reasons, but primarily because of uh, my voice. I have lost, I lost it so many times last year and it, it, it hurt me for several months and we, I've got to start managing it a little bit more. Um, but I, I'm going to be doing more of these live chats. We're going to try to do them every other week. So about two weeks from now, I'll probably be doing another one. And the next one will just be strictly questions and answers. I was very tickled to bring on Richard. Um, he's a good friend and we appreciate his videos and him coming to Hive Life Conference. But we'll be focusing more on your questions. So between now and then, go ahead. If you're you know, going through the bees through the week, just write that question down and, and we'll try to get to it here. I really appreciate everybody who came to Hive Life. And we really appreciate the people who join us on these things because this does affect hive life and hive life is impacting the industry and changing the way people do things and how vendors are selling things. And that maybe sounds a little audacious and arrogant, but it is. And we appreciate you helping us be able to do that because our goal is to bring you guys better education and bring you better products and to make this industry much stronger and healthier because heck, I'm hoping Laurel lets me hang around another 30 to 40 years. And I would like to have an industry that's awesome, strong, and fun. So Bonnie says, I will see you next Saturday in Allen County. Last thing before I leave, February 4th, I will be in Scottsville, at Allen County. And it is going to be a, a nice, it's a 
nice little meeting. It's like 10 bucks a person. I'll be doing the, the keynote presentations there. And there's some other really good beekeepers presenting. Bonnie's going to be selling some really great priced equipment there. You can get a loaded um, frame um, that's with heavy, heavy wax from Premier for $350. Um, assembled, ready to rock and roll. So there's going to be some good deals there. It's going to be a lot of fun. Look forward to seeing you guys throughout the year and take care. God bless. And we'll see you in the next video.